first classical piece I'm going to talk about this week is Wagner's Ride of the Valkyries. Taken from the third act of one of his biggest operas, this is without question Wagner's most famous work and one of the most easily recognized in all of classical history. Written throughout the first half of the 1850s, this actually begins as a prelude to the act, and a large portion of the song is actually over before the curtain raises during the opera. And it's supposed to convey the emotion of the Valkyries reaching the top of a mountain, and you can kind of see it as a battle cry of sorts. There are lyrics to this piece, but they're rarely present whenever this is performed outside of an actual opera. The piece was actually first performed in June of 1870, though Wagner did not approve of the initial performance because he felt that the piece wasn't quite complete yet. He was soon being asked to perform the ride portion as only an instrumental, but he strictly forbade it, feeling that it was somehow an insult to how the piece was supposed to be done. This actually led to some legal issues and blacklisting of the piece outside of the opera. But by the end of the decade, Wagner was conducting just the instrumental piece as an encore. Ride of the Valkyries is instantly recognizable, and from movies to cartoons, you can find it heavily used throughout all areas of popular culture for well over a century. The second piece we're going to look at this week is Samuel Barber's Adiago for Strings. Written in 1936 and first performed two years later, this is largely seen as the saddest piece in the entire classical canon. It was actually originally written to be part of his 11th string quartet, and in its original form, it follows a much faster, louder, and more violent musical work. And that part is actually briefly stated again in the opening of this piece. The big thing on this piece is how the uneasy tension and the overall dark mood are quickly set into place, and you can't get around the almost haunting feeling that runs throughout the entire thing. Many people also point to the softer, more simple climaxes that Barber creates on this, and it's obvious that he felt no need to make these grand sort of gestures, as he knew that the presence and the power he'd already established were more than enough to move the audience. Also, with this piece only running about 8 to 10 minutes, it really makes its point very quickly, drives it in, and then gets out without really wasting any time or having to drag things out. And you can easily make the argument that had it been any longer, the amount of sadness and intensity may have been too much. Due to the tone and the nature of this song, it's become a popular choice at large funerals, and it's been used at the final services for the likes of Franklin Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, Albert Einstein, Princess Grace of Monaco, and it was also performed at Royal Albert Hall on September 15, 2001 to honor all of those who lost their lives only a few days earlier. This is the type of piece that even people who aren't into classical music can completely understand, as the emotion is so strong and clear you just can't get around it, and it's a piece of music everyone needs to be familiar with. The last piece I'm going to talk about is Sergei Prokofiev's Montagues and Capulets. Written in the 1930s for his Romeo and Juliet ballet, this actually comes in the second part of that work. And when it comes to creating a dark, dangerous atmosphere, it's almost impossible to top this anywhere else in the classical catalog. After a powerful opening from the brass section, you get this almost motor-like rhythm. And it's really his signature sound, and it's this part that occurs at about 90 seconds in that almost everybody knows whether you know it's his work or not. It's the way that the strings create this amazing punctuation here that makes the song so fantastic. And even without the ballet dancers present, their movements are very obvious, and you can feel them in the way that the music bounces and sways. This is actually the point in the ballet where we find the Capulets dancing in a slow manner at their own ball. And when the second section of this drops in, the contrast is stunning. Here you find this calm, if not serene, interlude of sorts, and this very non-traditional choice is actually the moment when Juliet enters the ball. The main theme returns again when she comes face to face with Romeo for the first time. And again, these shifts in sound and tone are very unorthodox for that period of classical music. The piece has actually become iconic onto itself, and alongside its use in tons of movies, cartoons, and TV shows, bands from Deep Purple to A Tribe Called Quest have all found different ways to work this hook into their music, making it something beyond just a famous piece of classical music. Like it or not, classical music continues to play a vital role in all forms of music, and there are a number of pieces you should be able to identify the second that you hear them. So do yourself a favor this week and take some time to get your classical on. Hey!